I'm Alan Mortis, and this is Think Radio Presents Think Business. My guest today is co-owner of the firebrand delicatessen, Heidi Magnus. I didn't know it at the time, and thank goodness I didn't know it at the time, because what a wonderful surprise to um, start a restaurant, the little, little, the little firebrand back in 1995, and just feel the goodness of the honesty of making soup, the honesty of washing dishes. Welcome to another great conversation on Think Radio. Think Business is made possible by funding from the Ice Lab at Western, supporting innovative business in the rural Southwest. If you like Think Business, then I know you'll enjoy the other shows in the Think Radio Presents family of podcasts. Think People, a celebration of just how amazing people can be. Think Planet, conversations with thought leaders on important environmental issues. Subscribe to Think Radio Presents on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever else you get great content. And don't forget to help us spread the word by liking our social media channels and sharing the content we post. We're grateful to have you in the conversation on Think Radio Presents. Magnus is one half of a family restaurant operation in Gunnison, Colorado. Heidi rules the front of the house, while her sister Kate reigns supreme in the back. Over the past couple of decades, the Firebrand Deli has gone from newcomer startup, run by a pair of girls from back east, to being so deeply entrenched in the local community that no one can remember what it was like to live without it. And in that time, the menu has changed barely at all. Nor has the decor in the bathroom, where the walls are covered in giant, colored circles, inviting you to a three-dimensional game of Twister. Heidi set out to change the world through environmental science years ago, but now sees the world as a much smaller place and her mission in far simpler terms, to make a difference one great sandwich at a time. Heidi, thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I was thinking in advance of our conversation about how long I've known you. You seem to me like a native of this town because you've been here that long. You and your sister, Kate, have been slinging sandwiches for so long that no one can remember when the firebrand wasn't there. But you're not native to this place. No. Where do you come from? I grew up in New York. That's a long way from here. That's a really long way from here. And when I was a kid in New York, I loved playing in the woods and along the rivers and I loved all the wild places of New York and then that I heard that there were other wilder places hmm. and so I knew eventually I wanted to come to Colorado and I did eventually find my way out um, I actually came out in 86 and I was a biologist so um, what were you doing I did um, studies of high mountain lakes and streams and we would go and um, take a 50-foot stretch of stream and walk through it with electro shockers. So it would run a little current through the water and then it would stun the trout momentarily. We'd scoop them up, get <laughs> lengths and weights on them, and that would tell us what the health of the fishery was there. Wow. So did you go to school? Yep, and I went to school for biology. Right, where? I went to school in Fredonia. So SUNY, it's one of the SUNY schools. State University of New York Mm. at Fredonia. I originally went there for music and... Okay, so wait, 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 wait. (laughs) (laughs) In in the first minute of this conversation, we've gone from small business owner, you know, feeding the people, to biology, to music. Mm Mm-hmm. It, not in that order. It actually doesn't yeah. really surprise me. <laughs> well, we're supposed to have how many careers in our lifetime? Yeah, it's up to five or seven or something like mm-hmm. that now. I'm probably close. Yeah. Well, okay, so let's go all the way back then. Music. What were you interested in? Singing, performing, composing? Um, my family is very musical, and I think I originally wanted to be involved with music in any way. And that only lasted about two months after I got to a music school that had real music, really talented people there. (laughs) And so then I changed 
my major to scientific illustration, to English, to like, I don't even remember. But um, I, I eventually found myself walking through one of the buildings on campus. It was the biology to build, building. There was a huge downpour. And the only reason I went into the biology building was to find shelter. And while I was in there, I was reading um, uh, job openings and studies that they were doing. And I began to put it together that I could get paid for being out on a boat, being outdoors, connecting again with the rivers and streams that I loved as a child. And so I switched and then uh, became a biology major, which I stuck with. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to save the environment. And so I did wildlife biology. And then one of my first jobs was being a fisheries tech for um, the outfit in Gunnison. And so particularly you were interested in fish or that's just where you landed? I liked all of the critters, Mm -hmm. but I just ended up, that was my first job in Colorado. Yeah, yeah. Well, aquatic biology is sort of the foundation of of everything else. It's true. Yeah. And biology and scientific method informs, you know, my whole way of looking at life. So I still use it. Well, you're going to have to explain that. <laughs> well, I feel like my whole life um, has been a, an experiment. And I try not to have too many assumptions going in. I build my hypothesis and test it out and um, am always curious as to what's going to happen next. Also, um, having a knowledge of biology and um, how to keep things safe in a kitchen comes in really handy. Well, that's true. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's true. But let's go back to this moment where you've come to Colorado. A- and a question that comes to mind is, why Colorado? Why not Montana or Wyoming or California or Washington State? Have you ever heard of this guy? He's kind of obscure, but his name is um, John Denver. John Denver. Let's see. He rings a bell. Rocky Mountain. Rocky Mountain High, something yeah. Something or other, yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> okay. we, being a musical person, singing lots of songs with my family, we knew all of John Denver's music. Uh-huh. And so I connected with that joy that he, you know, not everybody loves John Denver. but I did. Yeah. I did. I was growing up in Texas learning to play the guitar, and you better believe I knew some John Denver songs. <laughs> Probably landed here. I wouldn't have said that was exactly why, but now that I look back on it, I can I can see that influence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so you came to Colorado. You're working as a biologist. Mm-hmm. It's the thing you've studied. The thing that I loved, the thing that I wanted to do, and that's how I was going to save the world. Yeah. And then... <laughs> you're not doing that anymore. Nope. There must have been a hypothesis that presented itself. <laughs> yes. And you said, what if? Well, I, after working for the state, I thought, well, there's too much politics. I really want to do research. I really want to, you know, do biology, not support, you know, whatever the politics is of the moment. And so I bounced around to different places to work. And one of the last places that I bounced to was um, in the Seattle area. Have you ever heard of Snoqualmie Falls? No. Okay. Have you ever watched Twin Peaks? Yes. Okay. You know the waterfall in the beginning opening credits? Yeah. That's Snoqualmie Falls. Okay. Behind Snoqualmie Falls, there's about a 150-year-old hydroelectric project. And for hydroelectric projects to um, operate, they have to have studies done every 50 years or so to see, make sure that they're um, uh, not harming the natural environment too much and they're not um, negative, negatively impacting natural resources or right. historical resources or cultural resources. <laughs> All of the things that dams tend to do. All of the things that dams tend to do. And they have to jump through hoops, hire biologists to go in and do studies um, to see what they have to do to mitigate what they're doing. Hmm. So the last, very last project I was on um, was at Snoqualmie Falls, and they gave me the cultural resources section because nobody else wanted to do it. And I found out that um, the Snoqualmie people, which is a tribe that lives in that area, considers that waterfall a sacred place. Hmm. 
And um, so the waterfalls, you know, in the spring when the snow melts, the water just crashes over the falls. And then all the mist that flies up, um, their prayers go up to their ancestors with that, the mist from the waterfalls. Mm. So if you know how hydro works, they divert water from the waterfall and they take the energy that would have been going over the waterfall, putting it through turbines and creates power. Sure. So no mist. So no mist. No mist, no prayers. No prayers, no connection to the ancestors. So I came up with this brilliant idea where I knew we still needed to create electricity. Mm -hmm. Dam wasn't going anywhere. Dam wasn't going anywhere. It's already built. It's like been creating energy for years. Some people wanted to shut it down. And um, I thought, well, what if we put a percentage of the natural flow over the water so people still get that idea of um, the seasonality of it and they still get the raging waters of spring and prayers can go up. And um, I came up with that proposal with my team and we sent it into the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and they, I could just hear them shaking their heads <laughs> and they basically handed our work back to us and said, can you come up with a different conclusion from your <laughs> research? <laughs> <laughs> Did they have one in mind or just? Yeah, full flows basically yeah. taken through the turbines, yeah. So I felt ignored. I felt as if I really wasn't doing good work. I felt as if my mission to save the world had gone, you know. Well, and this was tangible. It was real because you had, at least in your mind, formed this connection with these people. Mm -hmm. It yeah. wasn't just about the water and the dam and the concrete. It was about people. Yeah. Wow. And I thought that I had come up with a brilliant idea. And so when I was shut down, I was blue. And my sister, Kate, was living with me in Netherland while this was happening. And she said, you know, you're really good at making soup. Why don't we go back to that little town that you love? What is it? Gunnison, Colorado? Let's start a coffee shop. And I was like, <laughs> okay. And just like that. Just like that. You guys loaded the station wagon or whatever you had and came to Gunnison? Mm-hmm. Yep. And it was, um, I was returning to Gunnison after having been gone for about eight years. Hmm. And so it felt like coming home because this is where I feel really at home. Well, a lot of people feel at home here, like a lot of communities everywhere. And one of the reasons why people feel at home here is because they love the firebrand delicatessen. So you not only felt at home here, but you made a home here for other people. But I want to talk about... The process. You came here. I'm going to make soup in a coffee shop. Oh, when we got Talk here. Talk us through that evolution of how it went from that to where we are now. By the time we came back, the steaming bean had opened. And so prior to that, the only espresso had been at Cottonwood's clothing <laughs> shop where Jay Miller operated a business. Such a common experience in small rural towns you get your espresso wherever you can yeah <laughs> <laughs> right so the steaming bean was doing a great job and so we were like okay so what what do we do now and kate was like well you know i know how to i, I worked at a deli basically back in new york when she was 16 years old she was working at a, an ice cream shop that did some deli stuff and she knew that business in and out mm. Um, they trusted her there. They left her alone there a lot. And um, and she felt really confident that we could do that well and still do soup and just serve regular coffee. And I actually had a really difficult time changing from my identity as a scientist to mm -hmm. a dishwasher. <laughs> that was difficult transition in the beginning. Well, because um, it's difficult to see dishwashing as a way to save the world. Right. Which Little is what you set out to do. did I know. Little did I know. <laughs> Once again, you're going to have to explain that. 
Well, and I set you up because I know you well enough and I've, and I've enjoyed what the firebrand is and does for so long that I know that there is an aspect of saving the world one sandwich at a time philosophy to what you and Kate have created. Describe it. How well, did you get there? How did you get over that moment where you're like, wait, I was going to be a... I was going to be, you know, Dr. Magnus. I didn't know it at the time, and thank goodness I didn't know it at the time, because what a wonderful surprise to um, start a restaurant, the little, the little fire brand back in 1995, and just feel the goodness of the honesty of making soup, the honesty of washing dishes, the, um, the desire to nourish a public, the desire to have a door open on the first block of Main Street. <laughs> I mean, I, I basically mm-hmm. just didn't want to work for the man anymore. I just want, didn't want anybody telling me what to do. But little did I know that my goal of saving the world was a little bit easier um, at 108 North Main, where the firebrand is. Well, because for one thing, the world you're talking about at 108 North Main is smaller. Mm -hmm. You can actually see it. It walks through your door, right? I mean, this idea of saving the world, that is such a huge responsibility to to try to assume on yourself. It's big and undoable, and there's lots of ways to screw up. But when you do something which is simple, like a sandwich, a muffin, a cookie, it's not easy, but it's simple. And um, doing it over and over again every day in a slightly different way, we fine-tune. And then we also see the gifts of doing that simple effort and being an honest person in the world, trying to, um, you know, provide comfort food, basically. (laughs) Yeah, well, I can attest to that. But tell me, how do you see that reflected back to you in the people that you serve? It's one thing to, to approach washing dishes with that sort of philosophy. Do you see the result? Do you feel that you can actually tangibly say, yes, we've made a difference? Yes. And often the um, feedback is immediate where somebody will come up before they leave the building and say, that was the best Reuben I've ever had. Or you just made my day, you know, thank you for this beautiful food. Um, the People will say thank you, which is a wonderful thing. Or if I just look out on a Sunday morning and see tables full of people that otherwise would be at home alone. Mm -hmm. They are (laughs) connecting with their community out front. Mm -hmm. And it's like a party in the dining room every Sunday morning. There's um, regulars that come in and they connect. And it might be the only conversation they have all day. Um, One of my favorite people that comes in, our very first customer every day, is a 94-year-old woman. Mm. And she comes in, gets her cup of coffee, says hello, maybe gets a hug, and goes back to her house where she lives alone, you know? So it's it's a place where we get to connect with people and we feel the joy of, you know, seeing these human beings. And then um, we also get to see them enjoying themselves in the dining room. Yeah. And sometimes, about a decade after I've served somebody or a decade after Kate and I have hired somebody, those people will write to us or, you know, come back in to say, you have no idea (laughs) um, what you did for me back in the day. Yeah. And it was as simple as baking cookies. Yeah. And providing a safe place where, you know, you knew what was expected of you as an employee. Again, it's simple, but it's not easy. (laughs) You know what you're expecting. you know what's expected of you if you're a regular that walks in? You don't get to walk in and just say, I'm, I'll am i have this. No, no, no. You are greeted. Yeah. You know, and 
Um, we shoot the breeze a little, and it's kind of like a fun exchange across the register. I can't believe the things that people have told me across the register <laughs> before I get to have their order. Yeah. Well, I love that concept of creating a safe place for that to happen. But you've already used a word that, that came to my mind. Such an old-fashioned word, especially where business is concerned, and it's the word service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. It seems in today's business climate, it's about what you can do for me. Right. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to come up with, with some widget that I'm going to sell or whatever, but it's all about building my fortune, building my security. That's one of the things that intrigued me about you and Kate and how you have approached this business and how after, after all these years, you're still doing exactly what you describe. Um, in what way do you think that philosophy of business has the potential to change the world? Uh, when I think about the word service, I think that um, there's an element of um, awareness of the self as well as the other. Mm. It's awareness of, and it's some compassion thrown in there too. So when people walk in and they've got tattoos all over them and multiple piercings. The fact that they get greeted as if they're a human being means a lot to them. <laughs> if a <laughs> five-year-old kid comes in and I have a conversation with them, they feel seen. If a 92-year-old woman walks in the door, they're, they don't feel invisible. <laughs> and I think that's a big part of it. Well, and what I'm trying to get at is that we don't ordinarily um, link business with that kind of service. Mm -hmm. That kind of service is what the nonprofit world does. Uh, right? That's funny. Yeah. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to be. No. And it shouldn't be. No. Why would it be? Why can't compassion and service and safe space be a part of business? Uh, at a chain restaurant where there's fast food, you don't have time to make those connections. You need to serve people as fast as you can and get them out of your building as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. And you, you're, that's fine. You're paying for that service. And when you walk into one of those establishments, you know, if you make a human connection, awesome. But they often don't have time. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be a place that sells sandwiches for – Ten dollars and fifty cents a piece. Well, and artisan crafted sandwiches, <laughs> I might add. These are not. I mean, they're really good. Yes, you're right. I'm not going to lie. This is not a time for false modesty. No, it's not. Um, but I think that the thing that I try to do is make sure they feel seen. I'm giving them what they want. I'm giving them what they need, maybe not necessarily what they want, but they're getting what they need. And um, and it's amazing. I mean, sometimes, I mean, it's amazing the people that keep coming back um, because they're coming in not just for the delicious Reuben Kate just made, but they're coming in for the verbal abuse that I give because that makes oh, them horrible. feel loved. Yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> but it hurts so good. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite um, old regulars, we called him the Ricker. Um, I don't know if he's even still on the planet, but he was such a character. And um, and he would come in, and he was such a pain in my ass. And I just let him know, you know, I put him in his place every time, and I <laughs> expected every time he would never come back. And But he kept coming in, and it's because he was craving that. He was from Jersey. Oh, yeah. And Nobody knows how to treat somebody from Jersey around here. Right. Right, exactly. <laughs> so that's that's kind of funny that... That's what he craved, and apparently I was providing that as well as his egg sandwiches. Yeah. Well, service on a number of levels. Well, a lot of the people who tune into this broadcast and podcast are small business people. Either they've, they've launched and now they're trying to figure out how to grow, 
or they're sitting around, you know, the living room trying to figure out how to launch. Mm-hmm. You've set a pretty high bar here, and I want to give you an opportunity to speak directly to those people. What would you say to them about how to go about incorporating slowness, safe space, service, all of those things we've been discussing? How do they bring that into their business and make it real? Hmm. Interesting. I think the slowness that could be built into a successful business is um, quality slowness. So it's not just because you're being lazy or thoughtless. It's because you're being very focused Mm -hmm. on what the client um, wants and what what they think they want and what they really want. And um, and taking care and doing things with love. That's that I associate with a slowness. <laughs> so there's not a section called love in the a- average business plan. But you're suggesting there should be. Oh, yeah. how do we make this a part of what we do? I think it's service slash love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so the other thing I wanted to ask you about is the fact that you have not radically changed what you do in many, many years. People come in and get the same sandwich that they have learned to love. That also sort of cuts against what would be conventional wisdom about business, that you've constantly got to be evolving and growing and moving and changing, or people get bored and move away. What's your answer to that? There are certain people that only want to have the same thing every single time and sometimes they apologize to me for it and i'm like no are you (laughs) kidding me i have your order written down before you're even up to the register because i saw you coming Hmm. and um part of them likes being recognized and seen in that way Uh and um but we always have a special of the day so if you're wanting to try something different from what's always on the menu there's a there's a special Mm-hmm. So we're appealing to both of those people. So have the thing that they can rely on, the thing that they can predict how delicious it's going to be, what it's going to be like, and then throw in a wild card. Yeah. Love it. Um, because it it implies a certain level of contentment on your part, too, though. Mm-hmm. You're content to just be what you are. Mm-hmm. You're not trying to take over the world. You're trying to serve it. Mm-hmm. I also want to ask you, we're almost out of time, but I want to talk to you about your employees because you've already mentioned that sometimes years later, they'll write you a postcard from wherever they happen to be or a letter. They come back to visit. They bring their kids. What is your attitude? What what is the philosophy that you and Kate bring with you every day toward the people who work for you? Because it really is a tribe. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. The quirkier, the better seems to work. Um, undateable, they're really hireable at Firebrand. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, say again, say the question well, again. I, I'm curious to know how you feel about the people who oh, okay. work for you. So I actually knew nothing about the restaurant business when I first started. So people were training me. So I'm always open to being trained by someone who has a better way. So I, do, I try not to be a know, know-it-all. And um, I love the interact. My favorite kind of people are the ones that can work really hard and have a philosophical discussion at the same time. So if you're somebody who can get stuff done and do it well and have a fun conversation, it's fun for them, too. Mm. They're not just (laughs) you don't you don't have to just put your nose to the grindstone and don't talk. Right. There's lots of banter and and lots of. Hilarity. And so you never say to your employees, uh, "You're not paid to think." You're, uh, <laughs> you're not paid. To, you're not paid to uh, enlighten us today. Actually, sometimes Kate says, "I just want a silent kitchen. You guys need to shut up." <laughs> but other right. than that, yes, right. they have the freedom to be creative, yeah. and yeah, and that's a good part of it. Well, like any business, 
the deli business has its ups and downs. It's hard days and it's really, really fun days. Can you think of a story that you would share that's a good example of why you keep getting up in the morning and going and doing what you do? Hmm. Oh, man. You know, the party in the dining room, which I alluded to earlier, the fact that we've created a gathering place, um, and the fact that I live in a community where they show so much appreciation and love back Hmm. is huge. Um, The fact that every day is a new Petri dish. Um, Some people say, don't you ever get bored? It's the same thing every day. And little do they know, it's not. And why? Because different people come in, different people, people, different moods. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get a different beautiful vegetable at the, you know, the market to make a different soup out of. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I get to practice being a good human being. I, I, I may have screwed up yesterday, but I get another chance today to fine tune <laughs> skills. Mm. So um, I can't think of a of a particular juicy story. I'm sure I'll think of it as soon as we shut off yeah. the, camp, the, the microphones. Well, um, honestly, it's kind of an unfair question because you and Kate are a, a really juicy story. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love your story. So thank you for sharing it with us. I will see you tomorrow morning for a muffin. And I really appreciate your time. Thanks What's your favorite muffin? By. I love the ones with raspberry. Mm-hmm. Any of them that have raspberry. Mm-hmm. So raspberry banana, raspberry, raspberry banana, poppy seed. Raspberry ras- peach. That's Actually, that's my favorite. Mm-hmm. Right? Raspberry peach. Okay. I think that might be in your future. <laughs> Good. Heidi, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much. That was really fun. Thanks for watching. Join us next week for another great conversation on Think Radio Presents Think Business. 